Battle consists of two phases, Maneuver and Combat. In Total War Warhammer 2, Maneuver can broadly be defined as deployment, movement, and positioning of units. In today's video, we'll look at three different live battle examples, starting with the Beastmen. Beastmen are well known for being one of the most maneuverable factions in the game, having lots of units with Vanguard deployment. So today, let's do things a little bit differently from what I do for my normal videos. I'm going to go over my army composition and build and deployment first, kind of talk about my reasoning here, and then we'll look at my army, uh, my opponent's army after that as we go through the battle. Um, so right off the bat here on this map, we've got a few impassable terrain pieces and scattered patches of forest. So I've taken advantage of that. I've got four units of Centigors with great weapons hidden in the woods here, all concentrated, ready to sweep out and overload on this flank. Got five Ungor Spearmen Herd. I'm up against the Empire. It should be noted uh, in a nice crescent formation here, spread not too far, but in a position where they can reasonably try and get to each other to assist. Same thing with these uh, Ungor Raiders here. They are spread, again, a little bit, not too much, so that they can still support each other, but not cl so close that they'll all get uh, occupied if they get charged by a unit of cavalry. My three heroes do not have vanguard deployment, so they're back here at the edge of my deployment zone, ready to run up and uh, join the fun. And I've also got two hounds here, as close as I can get them to my opponent's deployment zone, ready to immediately rush in and throw him off balance, him or her off balance. Uh, so, as it is, my plan is, again, just to kind of overload this flank here. I've got the left side, or sorry, the right side of my formation anchored against this impassable terrain here. I'm going to have to circumnavigate uh, this terrain here, but uh, now let's kind of go into live, and I'll quickly kind of go through my process of how I would analyze my opponent's army in battle, right? So as soon as the battle starts... I would recommend quickly just mouse over your opponent's armies here. We've got some Empire Knights, one unit of Demogriff Knights, War Wagons. Steam Tank is a source of terror, obviously, for the Beastmen that it can be a big problem, so I want to be aware of managing the Steam Tank. A couple of Outriders over here on the flank as well. So immediately, it's kind of my first moves. I'm going to wheel my formation around again, still trying to keep my right flank anchored against this impassable terrain here, and just push up the left side of my formation and start to engage a little bit piecemeal. Uh, Beastmen are a faction that don't really want a fair fight most of the time. You want to try and use that mobility to your advantage to try and gain favorable engagements. Here, I'm gonna load in with these hounds and try and pull these Empire Knights away from support. If I can fight them in the woods as well, my large units won't suffer forest penalties while these Empire Knights will, but my opponent Counter charges in, breaks some of those hounds, and I have to pull away there. Balthazar also swooping down, a little bit dangerous. These Outriders come over. I'm going to uh, put my archers to work against them. Uh, the grenade launchers in particular are quite dangerous. They do a lot of damage, but they don't have too much range, so I can counter skirmish them reasonably well. Gorbel's running up to hide in this forest from the steam tank. You can see the main gun is opening up on him. And Morgar, because he's fast enough and has poison, the steam tank is slow enough uh, if I can get Morgar in contact with the steam tank, he will actually keep it locked in place, more or less, like it won't be able to get away from him. We'll throw him around quite a bit, it won't kill him, but it'll be just a, a nice, weird interaction for everyone. So now, kind of deploying the Centigors here, pushing them up and around the flank, trying to start to uh, get at some of these Empire Knights. In the meantime, you know, I've got some of these Ungors getting terrified away, I am now concentrating my Ungor Raiders a little bit here. In the heat of battle, you don't always have time to micro your units and spread them out like that, so they're just going to be in a little bit of a straight line there, somewhat, but uh, the Centaurs start to wheel up and around, and my opponent's actually going to deploy his Empire Knights now that I've opened up these archers here um, to go after, yeah, try and charge them down. Ungor Raiders, reasonably decent, only 19 melee defense. They do have 26 attack and 26 weapon strength, not complete pushovers in melee. They will get hammered hard on the charge there. I managed to interrupt one unit here. Demogriff Knights charge into my summon spawn, but that leaves the back open for my uh, Centigors to swarm in, and we easily just overwhelm one unit of Empire Knights. Uh, Gorbel also getting deployed at this point. Going to come after this unit that came and uh, ate up the Archer here. We've got a few Spearmen 
potentially in the position of support as well. If summoned Feral Manticore also jumps in against them. So I've managed to bail out the other two archers reasonably well here, and they're going to be firing back against the Outriders. This War Wagon is now somewhat vulnerable. These spears may be able to come support, but I've got some rallying spears coming back to potentially tie them down. And now I'm going to break up my Centigors. One charges into the back of the Demigriff Knights here. Another one is going to go after the War Wagons after we outmaneuver these spearmen. Just move up and around and then to the side there. Another unit I'm going to keep in the pocket against uh, Empire Knights once an opportunity opens up. Actually, yeah, this one goes after the Empire Knights. Spearmen get pulled away, and now the Centigors, this unit, charges into the War Wagons. I'm going to be able to take them down pretty well. Gorbel and the Manticore still just harassing this unit of Empire Knights, not allowing them to get free. And because of all the summons, I've got a pretty good spike on the balance of power. Likewise, Ungor Spearman Herd will trade very well against Empire Spearmen in some nice uh, spear on spear action. <laughs> And the Summon Manticore to go after Balthazar, my opponent's lord here, has been slinging spells left and right. The Steam Tank's still relatively healthy, but mostly, again, I'm just ignoring it, uh, and Morgur is sticking to it. You can see the speed down to 37, Morgur's 39 speed, so with the Poison Interaction there, he will be able to consistently keep up. Not to mention the Steam Tank is exhausted, whereas he is only tired. So, with the War Wagons gone, most of the Empire Knights dealt with, I'm going to bring my Centigors back together finish off this last unit of Empire Knights. Gorbel is going to say sayonara, move over to the steam tank, try and chop it down with Morgur. And just like that, the Centigors have managed to defeat a superior number and quality of Knights, Demigriff Knights and Empire Knights both. And uh, the, <laughs> the Ungor Raiders still firing as well. The two relatively free are going to get charged by the steam tank here. We'll move in for a little bit more cinematics as a lot of the really kind of high level stuff is over for the most part. Gorbel gets uh, backed up on and just catapulted as he usually does. Nice plague of rust there on him to bring his armor down a little bit. But things are looking pretty grim for the Empire at this point. Uh, these spearmen got the Manticore enraged, which is pretty good. But these other spearmen are pretty much gone. The Outriders somewhat isolated here. It's pretty much just the Steam Tank and Balthazar along with a handful of Empire Knights here, a couple of Empire Spearmen scattered around, again losing to Spearman Herd. And that mostly just leaves the Steam Tank left. We do have a few replays to get through today, but I want to show you guys some fun. Gorbel at least gets one good charge in there. And of course Morgur still just hanging on like a barnacle. Speaking of barnacles, next up is a faction that is not well known for their maneuver, Vampire Coast. First, let's take a look at the army breakdowns here, just quickly to go over some values. I know a lot of you guys like when I do this, so Morgur doesn't really do a lot by himself, but the summons are nice. Mostly, they were just used to tie down and control the steam tank here, so it didn't terrify my entire army. Um, Gorbel, likewise, mostly just a distraction piece as well, didn't actually get that much value, um, but a threat enough to the steam tank that in the late game, you know, forced my opponent to concede. And Ungor Spearman Herd also doing their job of kind of holding the line, trading with Empire Spearmen, helping to support various engagements, and also act as glorified meat shields. A couple of the Ungor Raiders likewise did the same, um, but two of the Ungor Raiders actually very nice value that were able to be protected there. Definitely MVPs are the Centigors of Great Weapons, all trading very cost-effectively. For the most part, I guess the one had a little bit of a rough time, but... Um, you can see my opponent's Empire Knights did okay, but none of them really paid for themselves. Neither did the Demigriff Knights. Grenade Launchers and the regular Outriders were pretty decent. War Wagons were a bit of a tough pick. Steam Tank got quite a bit of value, but unfortunately they are very expensive, so not quite enough in terms of damage. They can tank. <laughs> Get it? Anyway, um, Balthazar did a little bit as well. But uh, for myself, the Hounds, just kind of here, again, glorified meat shields for... Centigors in that mobile engagement allow me to get the advantage there and uh, and win out. So well played to my opponent. Let's go on and get to the next replay. As promised, we're back with the foul vampire coast. And this time, Queen Bess? Yes, indeed, against the dwarves at that. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about this uh, army, the map, and the positioning. As you will have seen a la in the last replay, Terrain is a massive part of not only your army composition, but especially your deployment and initial moves, uh, you know, in a given battle. 
On this particular map, we've got this big old rock formation kind of mountain here that interrupts line of sight for cannons directly from your opponent's deployment zone. Therefore, Queen Bess can potentially hide from counterfire here, fire up and over the rock in a nice arc, and be able to get at my opponent. So that's the idea here. The rest of the build is complementary to that. Whoops, we've got uh, a fleet admiral with a pistol and two gun crab uh, gunnery whites to help feed ammo to Queen Bess and, of course, Lord and Caster. Uh, lots of zombies to help tank damage, and on that same note, Sirens. Given that dwarfs, they are magic resistant, yes, but they also don't have a whole lot of magic damage, not to mention their units are generally pretty low melee attack, and with this charmed debuff here that the Sirens have, it'll make that melee attack even lower. One more unit of halberds just for some more meat, and a couple of handguns in case of gyros. Uh, talk a little bit about my op opponent's deployment and positioning here. Yeah, I did not see this initially, but he's got a couple of rangers back here in the woods for not only visibility, but to move in and potentially take out some artillery crews. There's another one over here as well. I've also got some hounds, likewise, in deployment over here for a similar reason, just to gain visibility, potentially chase down routing units that may get terrified away or go after cannon crews and whatnot. So let's go ahead and get started, and then again, I'll kind of go through. I, I didn't see these guys hidden in the woods here, I will fully admit, um, throughout the battle. So we'll just ignore them for now. And the stuff that I do see here, we've got Dwarf Warriors, a couple of units of Slayers, including the Dragonback Slayers, uh, some Corlers, two Cannons, uh, actually three Slayers, <laughs> and uh, two Thanes, plus Belagar Iron Hammer. So quite a bit of heroic punching power, very cost-effective as well, no... Uh, spells or abilities on any of those three. Pretty good stuff. I'm going to open up with Queen Bess and get a really nice contact immediately on those Quarrelers. Now, from the dwarf side here, I'll talk a little bit about as they start to move up. Um, if you, in your deployment zone, put the cannons on like the far right and left of the deployment zone, you could potentially have line of sight on Queen Bess, like from the extreme end here, and be able to fire in from a distance. That would require you with the two cannons to potentially split up your forces or else deploy like way over on the side here where you could be more vulnerable to like a mass vanguard of Morngulls or something. Not that that's... I mean, I'm not playing Sartosa, so I don't have the vanguard uh, free company militia as well to put alongside them, but potentially a threat. I don't know. Morngulls are... I don't think they're as good as most people think they do think they are, but anyway, back to the movement and positioning. You can see as my opponent's moving up this kind of alleyway here of this two-lane map. I'm going to move to block this lane, and a lot of his forces are going to become bunched up over on this side, so I'm moving all three of my heroes up to kind of counter that concentration. And again, the idea here is just to try and drag this battle out, continue to feed ammo to Queen Bess, and just generate value that way. Already, Queen Bess generated some pretty good value. We have a look here, 38 kills, 672 damage value, nice hit there. Goes up to 856. So far, so good. I'm gonna summon up a unit of zombies, just as a little bit of a, you know, line breaker here to disrupt my opponent's advance even more. Again, I have not seen these rangers that are moving in, so I'm, I'm like wondering, why are my handgun mobs dying? Uh, it's fine. They're 550 points. I don't care about them that much. This unit of rangers is gonna get into position to start firing at Queen Bess. Replenish some ammunition already, so generating some nice value from the gunnery whites there. And as the dwarfs advance, we're just going to get in a nice engagement across the line here. Um, generally, it would be better to not blob in these units, but given that we're constricted by this map to this kind of narrow space, uh, it's not really a lot of opportunity for flanking, so you just blob in and hope for the best. <laughs> Against these dwarf warriors, actually, you can see they're down to 13 melee attacks, so the sirens are going to take minimal damage, if any at all. Uh, meanwhile, these zombies are dying, and again, I'm not sure why. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm going to be throwing some Invocation of Nehex on Queen Bess. Invocations of Nehex? Yeah, let's go with that. Meanwhile, the dwarfs are finally getting into combat here. The Pistol Admiral going to pull back. She does have an item, Black Pirapt, that's going to allow her to generate some extra winds of magic here. It is quite good, in my opinion, along with her damage resistance item. And the three Gun Crab heroes are all concentrating on this first Thane here. Is a little bit uh, out of position, so to speak. Again, from my opponent's perspective, he really would want to concentrate all three of these heroes 
into this same area where mine are and just continuously try to pressure them. Maybe skirt through some gaps here, get up and back at Queen Bess. Rangers have actually used quite a bit of their ammunition. Queen Bess's crew is still fine because of the angle they're firing at. Again, this is coming down to positioning. Because they're firing directly from the back, not a lot of the Corlers, uh, the Rangers' bolts are actually hitting Queen Bess herself, right? And if you shoot the artillery pieces, they do take damage. You can destroy them even with small arms fire. So it would be better in this situation, number one, to take all these Rangers and focus on Queen Bess first as a priority. Or number two, take this unit of Rangers over here to the side where they're actually going to be getting more contact on the artillery itself. Which is now landing hits against some more high value targets. These Rangers over here... Um, are definitely getting hurt pretty bad. The Thane has high enough weapon strength that he will deal consistent damage to the Sirens. Only 41 melee attack. I mean, he has an okay chance to hit. It's like a 45% chance to hit, give or take. But still not amazing. Belagar, likewise, doesn't deal magic damage either. So the Sirens, while they will take damage from the heroes, will also hold them in place quite well. And another aspect of them, the Terror, coming in here very well. Meanwhile, my doggos hadn't really highlighted them too much since the last game was all about the mobile units, but they came in after my opponent was occupied, didn't see them, uh, and they got on the uh, cannon crews. They've also chased some routing units, and they're just going to continue to do that. They obviously, unless I miss micro them, which I very likely will, <laughs> won't get caught, and even as I say that, they're about to get caught by some slayers, which obviously they're much faster. If I were on top of that, they would not be caught, but Things are looking pretty well for me at this point. Uh, Queen Bess, crumbling, but still alive, and those Rangers have actually used all of their ammunition. And I've used probably, I don't know, maybe two and a half full ammos on Queen Bess, given the ammo refills from the two Gunnery Whites. Belagar's in combat against the Crab Lady now. Pistol Admiral has to be probably one of my favorite lore choices for Ghost, given that she has a pistol, so, you know, obviously there's that. And also... I mean, female vampire lord with a pistol. I'm not really the biggest fan of vampires, but she's got a gunpowder weapon, and I kind of like the nautical theme of Coast, even if I don't completely love their playstyle. Um, Gunny also kind of, you know, he's he's a apex zombie. He's the only hero level zombie in the game, so there's that. <laughs> I don't know. The gun crabs just appeal to me for some reason, but Belagar gets terrified away here. That's going to quickly lead to army losses. Queen Bess crew still alive, even though the piece itself finally was destroyed, and that'll be another victory. So, from, again, a map perspective, the terrain informs many of your decisions when it comes to, again, army composition, deployment, initial maneuvering. Um, you want to make sure that you have the ability to gain visibility if you're going to use artillery in on maps where you have interrupted line of sight. Hence the reason why those hounds were in the position they were in. And likewise, I didn't mean I didn't highlight them too much, but they did quite a bit of work just chasing routing units and also, uh, you know, eating those artillery crews as well. Credit to my opponent. I mean, getting the rangers in a position to do damage, you can see kind of the inflated value that healing gives in this one unit that was exclusively shooting Queen Bess actually did more damage value than the value of Queen Bess. That comes from the fact that the artillery crew was getting healed there. Um, but again, just concentrating all three of those rangers on Queen Bess could have turned things around. It was still going to be probably pretty tough to kill all these sirens here. Uh, and that's one reason why I think Grom Brindle, I call him Grom Windle, because I think he's literally the best choice in almost any matchup. And this is one where you need the magic damage to kill sirens. So I would definitely recommend taking Grom Brindle. Uh, Pete Gateguard also have magic damage. I don't know that I would recommend them here. But anyway... Back to the army composition. Uh, all three gun crab heroes did some okay damage, but mostly just using their support abilities like spells and ammo refills to great effect. Uh, the zombies are roadblocks, but some of them actually did pay for themselves, funny enough, as including the Alberts, which is interesting. The Sirens, again, yeah, not a ton of damage value, but soaking a lot of damage and also uh, causing some terror as well. My handguns got destroyed, which is fine. And the two hounds, again, doubling up just about on their value, which is fantastic. My opponent here, the Hero Squad, was a little bit of a tough run. Even though they're very cheap, they still didn't necessarily pay for themselves. War Warriors also kind of just got bombed out. Slayers uh, did reasonably okay, but wasn't quite enough at the end of the day. The Rangers did pay for themselves. I think they're probably the primary piece of that this army that actually did. 
but it's one of those things you've got to be aware of the terrain that you're on especially if you're going to be using artillery um, but as, even with vanguard as we've seen in both of these matches vanguarding in woods to hide your uh, units in dur during the initial phase of like scouting like checking your opponent's army can lead to success although you have to be careful if your opponent guesses that you're going to do that they may move to counter you in such a way that they can destroy those kind of corner vanguard forces very easily uh, one thing I recommend always, and I'll show you guys this another time, uh, when you're vanguarding, try and estimate like your opponent's vanguard zone, and there are ways you can kind of position around that so you don't vanguard literally on top of each other. But anyway, that's the topic for another day. Let's go ahead and get to the final replay. Last but certainly not least, the Lizardmen. Defending their jungle home against the foul wood elves. Let's take a look at what I've done here. Uh, once again, I've hidden some units in the woods. We've got on this map some interesting terrain. Uh, the center is dominated by this kind of big hill position here. In this matchup, solar engines are an essential tool though, so I want to operate them as much as I can in this low ground area here. If we kind of get low and look at the lines of sight, if I position them kind of more or less where I have them move forward slightly to like the edge of the woods right here, I have pretty good visibility over a lot of this area. My opponent, and granted, again, I don't know this <laughs> as I'm deploying my units, but he has deployed all of his units in the woods. Uh, I mean, wood elves makes sense. So uh, potentially they're going to be a little bit blocked here, and as a result, I'll move them back. But getting a little bit ahead of myself, got more skink cohort javelins here. Five, what, four of them? Yeah, four of them. Two chameleon skinks and four pterodon riders. So 12 missile units. Definitely a shooting build. Might seem a bit odd for lizardmen, but that is in fact the way. Uh, two saurus spears with some veterancy as well, just to juice up their stats a little bit. And uh, slon high mage. Control Air, we've got Tempest, and then some additional buffs, Apotheosis for healing, and then Hand of Glory for attack and reload skill for both melee and missile units. Two, again, Sora Scarvets on foot for anti-large AP heroic support. And, again, I mentioned already my uh, initial movements with the solar engines based on what I've seen my opponent. I do... Uh, reveal like these lost sylvan knights are not actually hidden the way watchers also a lot of these other units immediately spotted lizardmen i believe actually have the best spotting of any unit and then this for my opponent i wanted to quickly talk about here this deployment is definitely a mistake i would almost never recommend deploying single units unsupported like this especially in a vanguard situation like i get wanting to get visibility right off the bat but because i've got way more force concentration here they're just going to get eliminated very very quickly so I'm pulling back my solar engines. We're going to turn and fire at these lost Sylvan Knights. They are a very high value threat uh, that the solar engines directly counter. So we're going to go ahead and unload there. Meanwhile, I'm also pulling back and away from the woods. This is to pull the Wood Elves into a situation where I can shoot them a little bit easier with my short range javelins and with the artillery. And likewise, they won't be getting their kind of melee buffs from fighting in the woods. My opponent's going to keep these two Eternal Guard back, just in case I swarm over with these mobile forces, which I'm going to do. Meanwhile, the Sylvan Knights are running around as best they can, but the Solar Engines are definitely a massive, massive threat. The Dryads do manage to get in contact with this one Solar Engine here. We're going to come in with the Sora Spears and block that a little bit. Skink Javelins also got most of their volleys off again, just blocking the Dryads up here. Uh, aerial cast uh, Dwellers below there didn't do too much. Now we're kind of pushing her away. Ariel and Orion are leading the Wood Elves. While the Lost Sylvan Knights come up, they're going to rampage all over the Chameleon Skinks. Not actually rampage, but you know what I mean. And that's fine with me. Again, all of these are kind of acceptable losses for the time being. As long as I'm dealing damage to these high-value targets, and including these two right here. So we get this heroic fight going, and I've talked about this in previous... Uh, videos. In fact, I have a video specifically about single entity combat that you should definitely check out after this one. I'm going to move in with the Slon here. You might think this is pretty dangerous, but eventually we're going to get him into combat, mostly just because three versus two gives me much better odds. Uh, right now we're doing okay. The Sora Scarvet is actually going to get terrified away. This one here is taking quite a bit of damage, but the debuff from the Solar Engines will affect the melee stats of Ariel and Orion pretty significantly. Likewise, they both have low armor and rely on physical resistance. So the magic damage of the solar engines will do quite a lot there, just like it will against the lost Sylvan Knights. Uh, the rest, 
of the forces are just being used to harass these Way Watchers. These two Way Watchers are definitely the biggest threat uh, to the solar engines here, so I'm dedicating a lot of resources to just harassing them. I don't really care even if I win with these Pterodons. Uh, I've got a rock drop at this point, and I'm just kind of shooting in, just flying over. Might even send them into melee to really interrupt. The biggest thing is just to let the solar engines do their work, and right now they're doing just that. Eternal Guard, one unit finally came forward to support this melee engagement as the uh, Butterfly Lady and her Husbando are just getting absolutely ransacked right now. Nice uh, pounds of Orion, but the Sora Spears do have very high weapon damage. They'll be able to hit pretty consistently, and both Sora Scarvets are still just fine. Got Hand of Glory on one, Cold Blooded on the other to keep his leadership up. The Solar Engines both generated already excellent value, so another relatively quick one. But just to kind of draw your attention to my thought process in a lot of battles, how I look at positioning of units, and I think it's a topic that doesn't necessarily get a lot of attention um, in casts necessarily about that, especially the initial deployment and and uh, given the terrain and everything and how kind of each player plans on fighting the battle, right? No plan survives first contact with the enemy, which is why my plan to kind of push forward from the forest and position here wasn't that big of a change to just pull back and position here. Um, but anyway. Well played to my opponent once again. Isalon doing his thing. Not a ton of value. And I mean one of these Scarvets, 1500. The other one 500. So one of them took a beating. The other one dished it out. Um, but uh, the value. A lot of the value obviously coming from solar engines. Both definitely paying for themselves. Almost 1.5, uh, more than 1.5, in fact, for this one. I honestly think solar engines could probably be like 11 to 1200 points, and that'd be fine. But uh, anyway, uh, Pterodon Riders not quite paying for themselves, but tactically, uh, same thing with these Chameleon Skinks. Uh, seeing off very quickly this one Glade Rider, and then just occupying these Way Watchers so that they couldn't shoot my high value targets was tactically enough definitely to pay for themselves. Uh, Orion and Ariel, this is probably one of the few replays where you won't see them just do insane work. And uh, yeah, for then, any of you guys have been struggling against Wood Elves, just take two Solar Engines, literally counters their entire faction, <laughs> almost. Um, Sylvan Knights, so, yeah, same story for them. The Dryads actually trade reasonably well here, um, but at the end of the day, don't quite do enough. Eternal Guards also, one of them does pay for itself, one of them does not. But just to kind of finish out here talk a little bit more about uh, deployment and, and kind of positioning. We'll just quickly load into a battle here. I'm going to randomly just kind of scroll through and pick a map. And uh, yeah, that's not, not really a lot going on on that one. But let's say like Prague is a map you might see in, uh, in a tournament. So we'll just load in with this army I've got and I can kind of show you in real time how I would deploy. And also another big thing I didn't really talk about too much here that will help you control those units uh, is using groups. I would recommend getting used to using at least up to five groups, uh, get, depending on your hardware setup. If you have like an MMO style mouse with lots of buttons, you could potentially do more. Um, but for this, um, this is a build I had been theory crafting potentially against Tomb Kings. Let's pretend I'm gonna be facing them here. So first off, let's start with an analysis of the map. Frog here kind of has some interesting features. This right side for me, um, of the map uh, is on a higher ground and then it kind of gently slopes away to the left and then there are a few hills over here on the left as well to kind of counterbalance that so I have a few choices here I could potentially try and force my opponent down onto this low hill area uh, kind of lower hill area where I would have a more pronounced height advantage or I can deploy up on this right side where we'll potentially be going to be meeting on more open terrain. Uh, with this build I have, I don't really have any artillery. Marcus is kind of like artillery, but I can position him, you know, anywhere because of his vanguard. Um, so maybe if I position him like up here, have some mobile forces here. Are we on small unit settings? Why is it on small unit settings? Anyway, <laughs> but it, I would most likely with this build Try and potentially fight this up on this uh, open ground here. Charging the knights like up and around this flank to then come uphill is a little bit tough. So I might actually just keep them in a reserve right here in the back. Put the spearmen in a little bit of a staggered position so I can peel some of them back 
protect the back line if my opponent flanks around and have a couple of them to protect me from getting charged in the face. Put the swordsman in the center to then deploy against enemy infantry, hold them in place or potentially beat them. Um, we've got some free company here. They're going to be back line for just some overwatch missile support. Um, and then the caster here will be uh, probably hidden in the woods right here just to kind of conceal my intentions. I mean, it's probably pretty obvious I'm going to be doing lore of fire, but same thing with this warrior priest. He's on foot. He'll just be chilling there in the woods. He's got banner of eternal flame, which will give a fire in an AoE to all these units. Potentially going to try and use that with Marcus here to shoot at the Tomb King's Lord. And then, uh, yeah, might spread these guys out a little bit, but kind of keep them all in a similar position. And then Pistoliers, I'm well known for using, especially in a nice little concentrated force. So we'll, again, space them out somewhat and position them up in a, a position to immediately start pressuring. I might even put them all the way up here. See how close we can get. Not quite within range, but basically within immediate range. Whoops. <laughs> So now as far as grouping goes, you can use whatever system you like. I would just recommend you use the same system every time for all of your different armies. For me, I would do Lord on number one. This might seem a little bit odd, but I'm going to put my infantry force on a hard group control two. And again, this is because of my specific hardware setup, I tend to use more than five groups. Caster will go on three. Um, the Warrior Priest, I might actually... For the time being, combined with this force here, my skirmish line is almost always group 4. We'll put them on guard mode. Well, I guess there's no fleeing units here. Let's take them off guard mode. Mobile units on number 5, and the pistoliers on number 6. Uh, if I had, like, artillery, that would be on number 7. But honestly, for what a lot of people do, you don't necessarily need to have that many groups. Like, you don't even necessarily need to have your artillery, or your, sorry, your infantry on a group that you can easily access. Like... A lot of people will put them in the last group, so I'll put them in number six. You can control six to uh, put them in number six and then press this little lock button. Or you can just order your other groups first. But we could do like, uh, I don't know, caster will regroup on number two. Put these guys on three, the knights on four, maybe the pistoliers on five. And we can just leave the warrior priest with the infantry group on number six. Hard group them, control G, and that will put them in. A locked group and the locked group allows you to you know move them as a unit they will stay in formation which is really nice you can also how i'm doing this here is you press alt and then click on a unit <clears throat> and drag it around a uh, left click on a unit and drag it around so again you can use that to maintain positioning and you can even do that with multiple groups it might sometimes screw it up like you can see how it's moving the free company up into the front of the line there but at least it keeps the cab in the back you know and you can kind of control multiple groups to try and stay in formation that way. Um, yeah, just a little bit about the deployment, positioning, maneuvering. Uh, let me know what you guys think in the comments down below. I'm going to be planning to do more of these tactic vi tactics videos ongoing in the future. We'll try and do it every Tuesday for Tactics Tuesday. I don't know for sure if I'll always get to it. But hopefully you liked this video. If you found it informative, entertaining, be sure to share it with your friends or anyone else you know who's new to the game. Um, yeah, thanks again for watching, and be sure to subscribe, hit that bell notification, we'll see you next time.